Uh, if that's sort of uh, the, the best a totalitarian government can do, um, you know, paid family leave is just not going to move the needle. Scott, do you, have you found any places where these policies either seem to work or or they kind of pay for themselves or, or something? Uh, so I thought Liz's uh, article did a great job summarizing the evidence. Um, I've, I've tended to sort of look to some of the more pronatalist folks out there who, um, you know, would, would love to find policies that would move the needle and to sort of see what they say. So uh, I think now's, now's the time in the, uh, the conversation that, that we ring the bell and uh, invoke Lyman Stone. He had a long Twitter response, which is uh, kind of his modus operandi. Uh, to Liz's original piece when it came out. And what was interesting about it was, uh, to me, was that he claimed, first of all, that that 99% of uh, the, the well, first, that Liz ignored the programs that work uh, was the first one. Second, that 99% of what's tried uh, is too meager uh, to mm -hmm. have any impact. Um, so I guess he's saying Liz missed the 1% uh, uh, the, uh, of studies. And then third, that, um, you know, as an example of something that, to be clear, he didn't endorse, um, uh, but something that could move the needle was in Romania, uh, you know, where they outlawed birth control and abortion for. Uh, a, a, yeah, this you know, was under Ceausescu. So that's, it's that's right. yeah, at the, the peak of Ceausescu's uh, glorious powers. Yeah. So, you know, for more than a decade outlawing uh, birth control and abortion for, for most of the population. Um, and as far as I could tell, the, the, the claim was that uh, maybe in the long run, they increased the total fertility rate by half a child. Um, so, you know, if that's uh, if that's sort of uh, the, the best a totalitarian government can do, um, you know, paid family leave is just not going to move the needle. Uh, you know, I think Liz quotes somebody is saying like the, the amounts we're talking about versus how much it costs to raise a kid. You know, the idea that a three thousand uh, dollar child tax credit instead of a two thousand dollar child tax credit uh, is going to suddenly uh, reverse the trends um, just doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. And um, I, I guess there's that issue of like, even if it was thirty thousand dollars, I mean, what um you know, and I, I don't mean to put you guys individually on the spot, but, you know, what would it take to put you in the position of having more kids? And Liz, you're actually you you have one child and you're pregnant with your second. Um, you know, what would it take for you to, uh, you know, to have triplets or something like that? And <laughs> I mean, I don't think there's any amount of money that would make me have no. more kids than I than I otherwise wanted to. And I think that's that's the big problem with a lot of these. Most people, these aren't decisions that you can buy you know these are deeply based on deeply held beliefs and and values and they're not the kind of thing that you can easily sway with a little more money they have shown you know to, to be fair they have shown that like some of these policies can change the timing of kids they can make people have kids sooner but not necessarily have more um and you know they can they, there are some people that some policies might make convince you know it's not like literally they don't work on anybody like i'm sure that you know there are families that might have an extra kid if they got free child care but it's just not ever enough to make to make any sort of difference except for on the margins you know like yeah. it's not it's not making any wide scale difference i know uh I, I believe this was my birth announcement i was born in 1963 so it was the end of the baby boom uh but um it it the birth announcement it had a picture of a baby with a diaper and a stamp on the diaper saying another tax deduction, which is kind of, you know, a, a, a kind of early natalist kind of policy. Right. Um, and but it I don't think my parents took seriously, you know, the cost of children or how much money they might get out of it. And I know in my own experience and again, you know, we you know, we can't mistake this for kind of data or, or random controlled studies or anything like that. But the idea that you would be able to pay people to have more kids. It's, it seems kind of, um, you know, it's, it's just not gonna work. And, and Liz, in your piece, you do point to a number of places where it shows the timing of children, uh, you know, changed uh, in some of these studies, but it really did not increase the overall amount. Scott, what, um, you know, is there, yeah, talk a little bit about the earned income tax credit and some mm -hmm. of the other tax policies that have been tried that are, you know, considered uh, child friendly or family friendly. And yep. do they have the, 
the effects, the the intended effects, or is it mostly kind of rewarding people for decisions that they were going to do anyway? Yeah, I, d I don't know of good research um, that that shows uh, that they have moved the needle, you know, in terms of people that would have people that wanted to have another child um, being you know, uh, in incentivizing them to have more kids. I think, you know, the child tax credit is uh something that goes pretty high up the income scale so you can be a married couple making four hundred thousand uh, dollars a year and still get the maximum child tax credit uh per, per child um I, I think there probably are some families you know that switched from being two worker families to being uh one worker families and having a, having one of the parents stay at home um that's a that's a sort of explicit goal that a lot of social conservatives have for the program i think um, but I, I've, I've not seen any evidence to suggest that it's affected fertility. Um, the EITC, the Earned Income Tax Credit that you mentioned, is more of an anti-poverty program than the child tax credit is. Um, it phases out a lot sooner. Um, it's targeted much more towards the working poor. Um, and I, I don't know of good evidence there that that, that has also yeah. uh, increased fertility, but it does sort of raise, I think, what ought to be a real concern for a lot of the pronatalists um, who generally think that these incentives are going to increase uh, the number of kids being raised by married parents. Maybe mm -hmm. it's going to increase the number of kids and married parent families with one uh, parent at home. But to the extent that they target folks lower down on the income ladder, um, they could also increase fertility uh, in ways that maybe they haven't thought about um, non-marital fertility, unintended fertility teen fertility, uh, it, it really raises the question of, of is all fertility something that we want to encourage, that policy right. wants to encourage? And it's really relevant. There's good research showing that the decline in fertility since the Great Recession is overwhelmingly a decline in non-marital fertility. So it's hmm. it's not that married couples are having fewer kids, it's that single, single mothers are having fewer kids. Um, over half of it is a decline in unintended fertility. Um, so, you know, do we wish that we had had more uh, unintended births um, yeah. since since 2007? That's a big open question. That's um, a uh, fascinating kind of question, too, of like, you know, one of the ways, you know, if, if you, uh, you know, to paraphrase Willie uh, Sutton, who, you know, robbed banks because that's where the money is. Do you want to go back to a world in which uh, teenagers are having more kids right. because the you know birth that rate is way you know, down. That's a, that's yeah. a huge part of this too. Is it's and it's, just it's such so a triumph. Yeah, it's such a triumph. I mean, I think right. until about 1970 that it was typical that you know a first live birth was to a woman who was 20 or younger. Um, that has aged up, and it also seems, particularly with social conservatives who are often obsessed with you know issues of grooming and things like that. We have effectively desexualized adolescence and young adulthood uh, or, or late teen years, um, which would seem to be a win. But then it's like, OK, well, you know, why aren't kids having more sex or more births? It, it gets confusing um, very quickly. That's part of the live stream conversation that I had with Scott Winship of the American Enterprise Institute and Elizabeth Nolan Brown of Reason talking about whether or not the state should encourage people to have more babies. If you want to see the full conversation, go here. If you want to see another segment, go here.